Okay, great. I think um, most people have joined us now. So hi, um, and a very warm welcome to today's workshop on the ISO Climate Change Amendment. My name is Melanie Blackmore. I'm the CEO of Blackmore's and Carbonology, which both specialise in ISO standards. Our experts today will be introducing you to the recent unprecedented change that's affecting all our organisations that are certified to ISO standards, and that's the ISO Climate Change Amendment. So today our experts are going to be talking through the implications to your business and how to integrate the new changes into your current ISO management system. Um, but I think most importantly uh, for me uh, today, I do really hope that we can inspire you to make a difference and to make those steps to help to address the climate emergency. This is a great opportunity for all businesses to take action and act responsibly in terms of managing what they can do to address the climate, climate emergency. And also you'll be able to take away with you clear understanding of your next steps. So the International Organisation for Standardisation, otherwise known as ISO, uh, basically identified uh, that there was a, a very, very urgent need to address the climate emergency by taking climate action. And they recently introduced a sig significant change to reflect this. And this was actually initiated as a result of the London Declaration. So the London Declaration is a game changing moment for international standards to tackle climate change and transition to net zero. So in September 2021, the London Declaration basically made a commitment. It's ISO's climate commitment, and it was approved by ISO members representing 165 countries from around the world. This commitment commits signatories to consider climate change in every single new standard that's created. And not only that, it's also affecting the any existing standards as well, which is an unprecedented change. So never before have we seen such a change that's come into effect that's affected so many different ISO standards and that's come into effect immediately. Ordinarily, when there is a new standard that's um, either created or updated, it can take many years. And then once that standard has been introduced, if it's a, a transition lay standard, then that basically means that a company has up to three years to make that transition. In this particular case, this means that the change comes into effect immediately. So in February 2024, ISO and the IAF, which is the International Accreditation Forum, issued a significant amendment that's going to affect 31 different ISO standards. And yes, that is going to include the most commonly recognised standards, such as the quality standard, ISO 9001, environmental standard, the health and safety standard, and also ISO 27001, the information security standard. And that's why later on in the session today, we're going to be having specific work streams that are going to be focused on making the transition in those specific areas. And this will help you to prepare to get ready for your next surveillance visit, whether that's next month, the end of this year or next year. Obviously, it does come around every 12 months and the certification bodies are asking what you're doing to comply with these new changes immediately. It's happening already. So it's affecting all ISO certified organisations. So what are we going to be covering today? Well, we'll be going through what the new ISO climate change amendment actually is, what the changes are, why has this amendment been added, what happens if you bury your head in the sand and don't do anything at all to address this amendment, and also how to implement the changes. 
So Rachel Churchman, our technical director, will be taking you through all these different uh, aspects within the workshop. And also we thought that the best way to be able to help to transfer that knowledge into what needs to be done is to take you through a sample of the ISO Climate Change Amendment Game Plan, which resides in the ISOlogy Hub. And ISOlogy Hub is our online learning platform for all things ISO. So because of this groundbreaking change, we've created a game plan to guide you through step by step. So during the workshop, you'll be able to get a flavour of that where we'll be taking a sample of that game plan and you taking, taking you through that journey. So that will take us up to three o'clock where we'll have a, a very brief break so that we can then move you into the various work streams. Uh, so when you registered for this event, you would have selected one of the four interactive sessions. So just a reminder of what those sessions are. Uh, these are basically expert uh, led sessions with our leading ISOlogists on sub uh, subject matter experts on various ISO standards and also carbonologists who are experts on implementing the carbon standards. So the workshop one stream is going to be led by Steve Mason, who's a principal isologist at Blackmoors, and he's going to be talking about how you can integrate ISO 27001 with the new climate change amendment. So this is a standard that some people are kind of, you know, scratching their head and thinking about how, the, you know, climate change relates to information security. Well, Steve Mason will be taking you on that journey and providing you with lots of inspirational hints and tips on how you can go about doing that. Workshop two is going to be focused on the integration of the common ISO standards in quality, health and safety and environmental management. And that's led by Rachel Churchman, our technical director, who will take you through some specific examples. And also, again, there'll be an opportunity to ask her any questions at all um, about the Climate Change Amendment in relation to those standards. Then in workshops three and four, this is where we can go into more detail specifically in relation to carbon management, your carbon journey and also net zero. So workshop three will be uh, led by Joe Leggett, who's a carbonologist, and he'll be taking you how to create a carbon reduction plan. The reason that we focused on this particular area is because a carbon reduction plan is often a requirement of public sector tenders. So this is something that we can basically explain how you can do that and also how it can be aligned with ISO 14064, the carbon footprint verification standard. And I'll also be talking about verification to ISO 14064, which is becoming more and more in demand, uh, particularly in relation to things like CDP and, and other requirements that are being pushed down the supply chain. So that's all about verification of your greenhouse gas emissions. And then last but definitely not least, uh, we've got a, a session that's been run by David Algar, who's a principal carbonologist, who is going to be taking you through the seven steps to uh, achieving uh, net zero. And that's taking you through ISO 14064 and PAS 2016, which is a carbon neutrality standard. And also he's going to be touching on the new standard ISO 14068, which is the new pathway to net zero standard, which will be superseding PAS 2016. So we've got some really interesting workshops. We've got a, a lot of information uh, for you to take away and hopefully some really valuable action points as well. Before I hand over to Rachel for the main session, I'd just like to highlight some additional resources to support you on your climate change journey. Now, this is an offer, this is a one-time offer that we're making for attendees to this event. Uh, if you're signing up for the ISOlogy Hub, that's our online digital platform uh, to, to learn all about ISO standards, including obviously the, the Climate Change Amendment. So for those that sign up to that, you'll be able to get access to a free one-to-one -one consultation with David Algar on your journey to net zero. Also a free one-to-one -one session on the climate change integration specifically for your business with one of our consultants. We've also introduced a new ESG 
gap analysis. So that is something that is going to be extremely valuable for all organisations that are looking at basically benchmarking their ESG credentials against you know, some type of best practice. So that ESG gap analysis will help you to identify the strengths and weaknesses of your current ESG credentials. Then we've also got a pre-climate change compliance review. So this is where we're looking specifically at legislation and regulations in relation to climate change. Last year, Carbonology published the Net Zero 90 Days Planner. So there are basically 90 days of actions to help you step by step to achieve net zero. So although that's available on Amazon, we're including that free of charge within this offer. And also a, a free demo to basically look at your individual businesses training needs uh, with our Isology Hub account executive. So that's where we can help to identify where the gaps are in your knowledge and expertise in relation to ISO standards. And finally, if this offer was amazing enough as it is, um, the first 20 subscribers get access to our two for one offer as well. So not just getting one subscription, but getting two for the price of one. So that's it from me. Um, for those of you that are joining the workshop on the carbon reduction plans, I'll see you over there. But for now, I'm going to be handing over to Rachel Churchman, who is our technical director, who will be taking you through the main session today. Over to you, Rachel. Thank you, Mel. Uh, welcome, everyone, to this uh, climate change and management workshop today. Uh, really excited about these changes. It'd be great to, to go through these uh, with you all. OK, so the first couple of slides, I'm just going to touch on some of the areas that Mel already spoke about. So in terms of the, the new climate change amendment, it, it has been very recently introduced just in February this year, and it was uh, groundbreaking in the fact that it was um, an instant amendment and it was uh, became came into force um, immediately. And it was actually a total of 31 standards that have been updated um, to include the new climate change amendment. And any standards that are being released since February all have this climate change requirement in them as well. So as Mel mentioned, it's all of the popular standards, which I'm sure um, a, lot of, a lot of you guys uh, have management systems in place for. So it's the sort of a the Holy Trinity of the 9, 14 and 45, but then we've also got 27,001 for information security, even 22301 for business continuity and 50,001 for energy management. But other standards that you may also have, which are also included, are things like 20,001 for service management, 37,001 for anti-bribery, 41,001 for facilities management and 44,001 for collaborative business relationships. So um, there are some obscure standards that have also been updated, but it's pretty much all of the standards that we are all dealing with in our day to day operations. So it's uh, it's something we all need to be looking at now. So in terms of, of what's changed, the amendment itself doesn't prescribe specific actions, but it does add um, text to existing clauses within those 31 standards. And these new clauses are requiring organisations to consider climate change and how that applies to their organisation. So we need to look at the relevance of climate change. The organisations must assess if climate change is actually a relevant issue for their operations and context. And that's not just their products and services that they deliver, but it's how they actually run their business. We also need to look at stakeholder expectations. So there's been a note added that relevant interested parties can also have requirements related to climate change that we as an organisation need to take into consideration. So the overall intent of the requirements for clauses 4.1 and 4.2 remain unchanged because these clauses have already included the need for organisations to consider all internal and external issues that can impact the effectiveness of their management system. However, the new inclusions are assuring that climate change is considered within the management system 
And it's reflected that it's an external factor that's actually important enough as a topic to require organisations to consider it now. So why has the change been implemented? As Mel mentioned, it was part of the ISO's resolution to support the ISO London Declaration on Climate Change. So the aim is to make climate change considerations an integral part of the management systems, integral part of the DNA of the organisation. And that includes all the guiding policies and practices and procedures that come as part of a management system. It shouldn't be an afterthought or a bolt on. It should be part and parcel of the management system. But it's not the intention of the changes, for example, to turn, say, a health and safety management system or a quality management system into one that's disproportionately considering climate change. But it does ensure that organisations don't understate the importance of climate change where appropriate when they're running their business and delivering their products and services. And as we know, climate change is going to affect everyone and it should be a concern of every organisation and they should ensure they fully consider climate change to ensure they're resilient and adaptable enough to deal with climate related risks. So this amendment means organisations are going to need to address these risks where relevant and integrate those into st strategic objectives and they can look at what can be done from a mitigation point of view, but it is also an opportunity for organisations. The global business community will be one of those driving forces for paving the way to a more sustainable future. And it all starts with changing the way we work and making that shift towards embedding environmental consciousness into the heart of our businesses. So ISO standards are widely adopted and this change offers a catalyst for really meaningful climate action on a global scale. So the ICO and the IAF are not strong arming business into this. They are simply highlighting a consideration that should be on everyone's agenda. Whether you determine climate change is relevant or not, and then whether you decide to choose to act or not, is entirely up to you based on the needs of your business and the needs and expectations of your interested parties. So whether you go forward with any action or not is up to you. But at least this raises the question of how will climate change affect us and how can we reduce this risk, not only for us, but for others in future. So what happens if you don't address this amendment? So well, first and foremost, certification bodies are going to be asking you about these amended amendments effective immediately. They're going to be asking you about these amendments at your next external visit, whether that's a surveillance visit or a recertification visit, visit. And that's because the changes were effective immediately. Now, of course, you might already have considered climate change in your management system as part of determining your internal and external issues. So that may already be a requirement that you've addressed. But if you've not addressed the amendments ahead of your next certification body visit, you could run the risk of getting a non-conformity. So the amendment added to clause 4.1 especially states the word must. So as we all know, there's no getting away with ignoring it. A must is something we have to be able to demonstrate. Now, it's important to note, you don't have to complete a transition to get a new certificate to incorporate the climate change amendment into your management system. Your certification body will simply assess that you've adopted the new requirements and the considerations at your next external audit. And that's, again, whether it's surveillance or recertification. But more important than that, ignoring the changes can have wider implement implications. You might be missing out on opportunities. So let's just have a quick look at a few of those. So if we're looking at scrutiny and reputational risks, there may be stakeholder pressure placed on your business in relation to climate change and sustainability. Investors, customers, partners, they're increasingly prioritising sustainability. And ignoring this climate change consideration could raise, raise flags and damage your reputation if you're not being seen to be addressing them. There might also be regulatory risks. Governments are likely to implement stricter environmental regulations in the future. So it's best that you are prepared for this so that you don't face any fines or any restrictions. Other missed opportunities could be cost savings. 
So proactively addressing climate change can actually lead to energy efficiency improvements and reduced waste. And that saves your business money. That's bottom line. In terms of innovation, if you focus on sustainability, that can open up doors to new markets and technologies, giving you a competitive edge. In terms of practical business implications, let's have a look at um, higher insurance premiums. So insurers may charge higher rates in the future for businesses who are addressing climate risks. You might experience difficulties securing funding because banks and investors may be hesitant to support businesses who are not demonstrating a commitment to sustainability. And you may be limiting your market access. Certain markets might have regulations requiring sustainability practices from their suppliers, so ignoring these could actually restrict your market reach. In terms of how to implement these changes, many businesses are fearing that this, this change, this, this immediate change, is going to require a complete overhaul of their management system to comply. But the solution is actually look at, looking at integration rather than a full overhaul, because you're actually probably already considering climate change instinctively in some areas. The first place to start is to evaluate how these climate change considerations might affect your existing ITO management system. Because you may need to adapt some existing policies, procedures or governance or targets to address these new factors. You should revisit your current ISO management system and identify the relevant clauses impacted by the amendment. And as we've already seen, that's typically in the context area of the standard. So clause 4.1 and clause 4.2. So for clauses 4.1 and 4.2, context and interested parties, you could review your existing management systems context, considering if climate change is actually relevant to your organisation and your management system goals, and then have a look at those specific stakeholder expectations. So for instance, from investors, from customers, and from end users, just to see whether there is something there that you need to, to be aware of. Let's have a look at some of the climate change considerations. So we'll look at it in two halves. We'll look at relevance assessment, and then we'll look at stakeholder expectations. So for relevance assessment, businesses need to assess if climate change is a relevant issue for their operations and context. So remember, it's running your business. It's just not, it's not just delivering your products and services. So this might involve factors like location, you know, whether that's your own location, or location of any of your key dependencies, i.e. key supply chain partners, who may be vulnerable to climate change issues such as extreme weather events. You need to be looking at your resource dependencies. Again, reviewing what resources you have and you need, and which ones may be impacted either directly or indirectly by climate change. And that could be something such as water scarcity or depleting energy sources. You also need to be looking at the regulatory landscape. Many businesses are now being directly or indirectly impacted by that change in governance landscape. You may need to be reporting on your own carbon emissions and environmental performance, or you may be required to report to your customers as part of their own regulatory requirements, such as ESOS or SECR. So you should analyse your operations and context to determine whether climate change poses a risk or an opportunity for your organisation in any of these areas. So look at things like energy consumption, resource use, supply chain disruptions. Let's have a look at stakeholder expectations now. So this amendment emphasises considering your stakeholder expectations around climate change and also sustainability. So this could include customer demand for sustainable practices. Your customers might be looking and choosing partners with demonstrably lower carbon footprints or who, who are more transparent about their environmental practices. There might be investor requirements for environmental disclosures, typically around climate related risks and opportunities. They might be potentially seeking that you a strategy for how you're mitigating your gas emissions or adapting to climate impacts and these can all form part of their investment decisions and again regulatory body mandates so examples of this can include regulations on carbon emissions and pollution control 
or legislation that might restrict the use of certain materials or processes that are harmful to our environment. So you need to identify your relevant interested parties and understand their expectations regarding climate change and whether these are actually being actively addressed through your management system. And once you've reviewed all of those context and interested parties, issues, risks and opportunities, it's time for you to take action. So based on your assessment, you should incorporate climate change considerations into your existing management system, plans, documents, processes, controls, metrics, etc. So this could involve setting climate related goals. So that could be reducing your energy consumption. Or you might link some climate related objectives to your existing overall business strategy goals. You should be identifying climate change risks and opportunities and then formulate a plan on how these risks can be mitigated or opportunities explored further. And you should be developing processes to address all of these factors. So that could be implemented through channels you've already got in place already. So let's think about things like training programs, KPIs, performance reviews, supplier evaluations, and you can make and monitor your progress and make adjustments as necessary. Well, you might even decide to have your emissions verified by a third party. So this ensures that figures are correct. It combats all of those greenwashing um, uh, claims against you, and it, it will also identify those opportunities for improvement. And as we're all familiar with, any ISO standard, all of those 31 uh, standards that have been uh, updated, they're all about continual improvement. So you should monitor your performance concerning your climate change considerations, review your plans and actions regularly, and this will ensure that they stay relevant and adapt to evolving circumstances. So you can achieve this through tracking your greenhouse gas emissions, regularly measuring and reporting carbon footprint across your organisation and your operations. So that can include everything from energy use, transportation and waste, and you can be identified areas for reduction and set those improvement goals. You might want to monitor resource consumption, tracking water and material use and the metrics associated with those and analysing the data to identify any area for efficiency gains or maybe exploring more sustainable alternatives. You might want to be reviewing those risks that you've raised in relation to climate change and regularly assessing the impact of those risks on your business and that could be things like extreme weather disruptions on your supply chain or infrastructure or risks to your uh, resource supply chain. You can be benchmarking your performance, comparing your sustainability efforts against other industry leaders or best practice and identify areas for improvement and learn from others. But also listen to your customers and your stakeholders, listen to their needs and expectations and their feedback what are they asking you for? What are they feeding back on? And you can look to adopt strategies to better address their concerns. So what are the benefits of this amendment? There's loads of benefits that are gonna be felt by organizations that are taking this climate change consideration seriously. So let's just have a look at how you can benefit from actually actively addressing this amendment. There are environmental and societal impacts, which are, are positive. So first and foremost, you could be reducing your environmental footprint. So you can identify and implement practices that lower your carbon emissions and your resource consumption, which is going to translate to a positive environmental impact. You might achieve that enhanced sustainability and the reputation that comes with it. So by demonstrating a commitment to sustainability, you're going to be um, increasingly important for attracting those other environmentally conscious customers and investors. So suppliers with a climate friendly way of working are going to be actively sought after by customers. So by being able to demonstrate your reductions in carbon emissions, it's going to enhance your reputation. But do remember any sustainability claims that you make need to be backed up with data to prevent greenwashing. There'll be financial and operational advantages. So from a cost savings point of view, climate conscious practices can lead to cost savings, and that can be through 
improve resource efficiency, reduce waste, potentially lower energy bills. And again, these are all bottom line benefits. From a resilience and risk management point of view, by considering climate related risks, such as extreme weather, resource scarcity, etc., you can proactively develop those strateg strategies to mitigate these risks and ensure operational continuity. So, for instance, your business continuity could take climate change um, impacts into consideration as well. You may attract investment. Investors and shareholders are always looking for businesses with a sustainable strategy and a resilient business model. And you'll be able to achieve innovation and competitive advantage. Focusing on climate change and its impacts can lead to innovation in areas like developing or using cleaner technologies or uh, applying sustainable product development. And that's going to give you a competitive edge. In terms of improved reputation and stakeholder engagement, you'll have be able to enhance your positive brand image. So demonstrating proactive action on climate change is going to enhance your brand image and make you, uh, you know, more reputable amongst those environmentally conscious stakeholders. And you may be able to develop stronger stakeholder relationships. So by considering those stakeholder expectations as part of your climate change consideration, you can then better still make changes to meet those expectations and build stronger relationships with your customers, investors and regulators. From an overall improved management perspective, you could take a holistic approach and integrate climate change considerations into your existing management system. And that's going to undoubtedly strengthen the overall management system and be more comprehensive and more future proof in terms of future climate change considerations. And as always, continued improvement, always encouraging your organisation and constantly seeking ways to reduce your environmental impact is going to lead to long term and ongoing sustainability um, benefits. So to summarise, you must determine if, if climate change is a relevant issue for the scope of your management system and whether climate change is relevant to your interested parties. You should record the outcome of your discussions about climate change, and that includes any decisions agreed and any actions identified within your management system. And you could have set objectives and establish monitoring activities related to carbon emissions and climate change. So I'm just going to hand you over now to Carly uh, for a little reminder about our Isology Hub. Thank you, Rach. Um, it's lovely to see so many of you here today. Um, really pleased to meet any of you. Um, if we've not met before, I'm the service delivery manager at Blackmores. And uh, yeah, I do speak to a lot of our clients. So it'd be nice to speak to more of you following this. So if I'd like to just take a moment to introduce you to the Isology Hub, and how this can support you on your climate change amendment journey. The Isology Hub itself is a wealth of resources that span a huge range of ISOs, including environmental, energy management, IT systems, quality management and health and safety. The list goes on. Um, you'll find a wealth of resources, including the ISO 14001 roadmap, which is Blackmore's route to achieving or aligning yourself to 14001. This could be, a, if this is one of your considerations as part of your climate change mandate, the Isology Hub contains the full roadmap to implement the standard for your business. So basically taking you from nothing to being in a position to achieve certification at your own pace. There's also training. We have a wealth of courses very much aimed at giving you the breadth and depth of information that you need in order to understand a topic more fully and give you guidance specific to individual standards to include ISO 14001. If you're looking for a template process or a checklist, checklist, excuse me, chances are you'll find what you need in the hub and game plans, which is how we introduced action focused change, giving you step by step activities to tackle a particular challenge within your management system. Perhaps um, one instance you've had a management system for some time, maybe there have been changes in key personnel or the business has moved on, but the management system hasn't kept up. So you've got a bit of lack of engagement. The engagement amplifier is a game plan that could be the resource you need 
to reinvigorate our engagement within your management system. And of course, we have now introduced the climate change amendment game plan in the hub that we'll look at in a bit more detail in a little while. We have coffee break training. So there's a wide range of trainings in the hub if you're looking for something more focused and bite sized to support a specific area, if that's a standard or a clause requirement within your management system. And we also hold live events each month, live sessions each month in Q&A sessions. And these are a great opportunity to discuss any specific questions or challenges that you might have, um, but it doesn't stop there. All new members are welcome to get in touch to discuss what you've been looking to particularly achieve yourselves. And we can create a bespoke personal development plan for you, identifying the most common and relevant content in the Isology Hub for you to achieve your goals. And just to confirm the um, offer for today, and this is the only time we'll be offering this up until the 7th of June, um, is a net zero consultation with our principal carbonologist, David Algar, who'll be speaking in a few moments about um, carbonology and what they do. A climate change integration consultation, a free ESG gap analysis, the climate change compliance review, a review against legal requirements, and the net zero in 90 days plan of the book in order to be able to work towards that for yourselves. And a personalised demonstration with our Isology Hub account executive, Edward Southcombe, about the any issues that you want to tackle particularly um, in your business. And for now, I'd like to introduce David. David works for Carbonology and he will be talking you through the steps to achieve standards. OK, David. Hi, there. thank you, Carly. Right, let's get my screen shared. Right, you hear me OK, Carly? Cool. Yeah, perfectly. Thanks, David. Excellent. Right. So I'll crack on with the uh, presentation in a sec, but uh, good to see you all. Got a nice turnout. Um, sorry, just to clarify, Carly, uh, should I jump into the presentation or are we not splitting into the uh, breakout rooms? No, if you want to go through your presentation, David. Yeah, sure. Cool. Right. Share my screen. Right, bear with. Cool, right, good to see you all. Thanks for uh, joining the event today. Let's get him loaded up. Right. Yeah, so uh, yeah, good to see you all. Uh, my name is David. I'm the Principal Carbonologist here at Carbonology. Um, I'll tell you a bit about us as a business in a moment, but today we'll be giving an overview of what we call our seven steps. So it's our seven step methodology for achieving the carbon standards, essentially. So up until this point, Carbonology as a, you know, as a business and a service has been based around two standards. So we've got ISO 14064 part one, which is essentially the standard for achieving net zero uh, and calculating and reporting on your emissions. And then the other side to that is past 2060. So that is a standard for credibly demonstrating carbon neutrality, which is very important. Uh, you may notice there's actually three standards listed there. So past 2060 is soon to be replaced by a ISO. So ISO 14068 part one, uh, which we'll discuss a bit later on in the presentation. Uh, something we often get asked about, and I'll, I'll you know, tick this off nice and early on, uh, is the difference between net zero and carbon neutral. So net zero is generally defined and accepted as no emissions or very, very low emissions. Some cases you can only get it uh, so low, but generally net zero is little to no emissions, whereas carbon neutral is a state of equilibrium that you achieve via offsetting. So yeah, net zero is no output and carbon neutral is generally achieved via offsetting. And a quick plug for the ISO show. So uh, Mel's podcast on ISO standards, we've actually done uh, yeah, it would have been a seven um, episode mini series on this. So if you did want to hear me ramble on in even further detail for 
probably an hour or two. Uh, there's sort of um, seven episodes plus a lot more on there about uh, carbonology and what we do. So in terms of us, a uh, bit of context for those of you who aren't aware of carbonology, haven't heard of us. So we we're originally part of Blackmores. So we were a service within Blackmores. Uh, Mel launched it. I can't remember what month exactly, but it was in 2021, sometime in the summer, I think. Um, and it went pretty well. I'm glossing over things, but it went quite well. Uh, and then in 2022, November 22, we launched as our own service. So we are a carbon consultancy. So we help businesses you know, calculate and reduce their emissions. Um, yeah, we thought it was about time we launched as our own business and been going quite well. Uh, our core services are the ISO 14064 standard and PAS 2060, which I'll be discussing with you in a bit more detail as we go through the presentation. Uh, but something else to mention is our verification service. So we've been quite busy with that recently. So acting as a independent third party verifier, uh, which is quite interesting. It's something we'll discuss later on, but it's um, highly recommended that you have your figures checked by a third party. That could be us, um, always recommended. Uh, and then some of the other services we look at. So SECR, that's a, um, well, I refer to it as the baby of reporting. It's generally a lot smaller for most companies, but it's very, very important to get right because it's uh, legal, legally mandatory if you're a large company, if you're legally defined as large, that is. And then carbon reduction plans following the PPN 061 framework that uh, Mel mentioned earlier on. So don't have too much time to go over this. Uh, my colleague Joe will be going over that later, but essentially, You'll need a PPN 061 carbon reduction plan if you are dealing with the public sector. Very, very important. And then Carbonology Hub, which is our kind of uh, version of the Isology Hub that Carly mentioned, and I'll go over that in a bit more detail as we progress. So here's our seven steps, which I'm not going to read out because I read them out about a billion times. And I'll let you read them. But the important thing here to know is it's a cyclical process. So we'll be going through each one of these, but essentially it does go on until we get to net zero and we can all put our feet up. But it's yeah, cyclical, you know, we're all looking for continual improvement basically. So we'll repeat this each year and hopefully get better results as time goes by. Uh, we've also got our badges here. So we're looking at getting a new one potentially to highlight our verification service and differentiate between that. But essentially if you work with us and we implement the standards, uh, you get a nice badge. So you can put that on your website or your, you know, your email footers or something. Right, so to find that's uh, step one, basically, when you're looking at carbonology as a service that is. Uh, so like any project, it's really, really important to define exactly what you're looking at from day one. You know, if you think about a company making a claim against carbon neutrality or net zero, you know, if you see it written on the side of a company van or on their, you know, website or their foyer as you go in the building, you know, what does that actually mean? You know, what have they included? If you're looking at ISO 14064, there's two ways you can do that. So that is your organizational boundaries and your reporting boundaries. So organizational boundaries, that refers to your sites. So for a lot of companies, that's really simple. It's just a nice little list or a, you know, a table or something saying these are our sites. But if you're reporting at a group level or you've got different business units or you've got 100 sites across you know, 20, 20 countries, that can get a bit more complicated. That's why it's really, really important to define exactly what you're including in any of your claims and what you're potentially excluding for whatever reason. You also want to have that documented to maintain consistency because it's quite easy to accidentally include or exclude a site, you know, as time goes by. The other side of this is reporting boundaries. So this is really, really important. So that's the emission sources you're including. So yeah, again, this comes back to the claim of carbon neutrality. If you are going for that on net zero, you know, you might have great results, but you might be missing something. So it's very, very important to include as much as possible and report on that. Uh, and ideally, this will all go in your ISO 14064 GHG report. Coming back to, you know, the whole reason we're here is demonstrating how you're combating climate change. You know, if you can get out a nice GHG report during your audits, I think that will go down very, very well. Another thing to consider if you're at the defined stage is your subject of carbon neutrality. So if you're achieving past 2060, what you need to do is define your subject. So I won't spend too much on this, but it's essentially a small statement that uh, relays what you've achieved carbon neutrality for. So the way I think about that is it's sort of a agglomeration of your reporting boundaries and organizational boundaries. Nice simple statement just saying we have achieved carbon neutrality for X, Y, Z. Other things you'll need to include is obviously people involved with the project. You know, who's doing what, who's responsible for gathering data, who's got overall responsibility for reporting for the company. 
a lot of these questions here I have on the screen, um, I always think they sound like trick questions when I ask them in audits or if we're kicking off a new project, but it's really, really important. You know, what counts to for your business as a significant emission source, you know, in the context of your operations? Some will be more relevant than others, some not relevant at all, but it's very important to define exactly what you're looking at there. You know, what are the intended uses of this GHG information? You know, say you've got your results, what are you going to do with them? You know, it's important to have all that defined. The key activities you do as a business, you know, context of the organization. And again, sounds really simple, but the actual rationale for why you've chosen your subject, you know, why have you chosen these specific things to offset? And final thing to mention on Define is leadership commitment. Obviously very, very important to get that from the get go because you won't get too far on your own. Right, quantify. So this is the best one. Anyone that's um, worked with me knows this is the um, probably the hardest part. So the hardest part is, yeah, getting through the quantification. It's arguably the most complex, but it's also arguably the most important. So this is a number crunching stage. So this is where you'll gather the data you need for the relevant you know, sites, activities, you know, product services that you deliver and actually turn that into tons of carbon dioxide equivalent. And that's across scopes one, two and three. The reason we say carbon dioxide equivalent is because you're accounting for multiple GHGs. So there's more than just one, unfortunately, and we need to account for those. In terms of how you calculate emissions, I always say this is easy, but I would say a monkey can do this bit because it's just timesing two numbers together. Come back to that in a moment, but it's essentially you take your metric, whether that is kilowatt hours of energy consumed or miles driven by a certain type of vehicle, and you times that by a con conversion factor. We're really, really lucky in the UK that uh, DEFRA give us a nice big old list of conversion factors that are free to access and they're quite extensive. Uh, it's different in other countries, but um, we're very lucky here. That's the easy bit. That's why I say, you know, a monkey could do that bit because it's two numbers times together. The really, really hard bit for every company is actually gathering the data you need. So a lot of people, a lot of companies work really, really hard to get that data and to turn it into, you know, say a jumbled up spreadsheet or, you know, hundreds of um, bills or in some case, you know, patchy information and get that into a state where you can actually apply those numbers and actually use it. The gathering data is very, very important and it's very tricky. Um, something that's very, very important here, and this actually goes back to, you know, if you were being audited on this, is to write everything down. It's probably my most common finding in audits is just write everything down. It's a bit, bit more to it than that, but it comes back to transparency. And colleagues mentioned earlier about greenwashing. It's a lot harder to be accused of any greenwashing, you know, inadvertently, uh, if you transparently record everything. The other reason you want to get your methodologies recorded is for consistency. So then you can start to build a sort of management system around your GHGs and how you report on them. So ideally, you know, you have that written down, you can refer to it next year, make sure you're doing the same thing and nice and consistent. And keep your estimates conservative. That's what we want. It's better given the choice to slightly over report than under report. Commit. Um, so now. Hopefully we know what our baseline is if we're going through this exercise. So baseline being the first year generally that you report on this, it's time to make a carbon reduction plan, uh, which my colleague Joe is going to be going over in a, and Mel is going to be going over in a bit more detail later. So I won't spend too much time on this, but it's essentially a set of uh, targets and milestones you'll set to reduce your emissions over time. It's also really important to remember, and this is you know, a minor aspect to it, that the lower your emissions, the lower your offsetting cost is going to be. So if you're paying for offsets, Lower your emissions, lower your costs are going to be, depending on what you go for. I'm sure a lot of you are actually aware of what your business can do um, in terms of reduction initiatives, so better lighting, better insulation, uh, electric vehicles. You know, it's a controversial one. It's something we all want, but it's difficult to implement for some businesses. Um, but it's just about having a strategy to actually do that via targets and milestones. You're also going to want to develop uh, some sort of commitment to net zero slash carbon neutrality, hence the name commit, particularly if you are on that public sector framework, it's vital that you have that sort of public commitment to net zero, very, very important. Uh, something that always comes up um, with businesses is, you know, it's not an objection, it's just a query, is businesses want to grow, don't they? They want to make money, they want to open new sites, hire new people. That normally means your emissions are going to increase. So, Although we have to get to net zero, you know, in the sort of next few decades or sooner if possible, the way you can demonstrate improvements, again, it comes back to audits, is uh, intensity values or intensity metrics. So, for instance, displaying your emissions relative to your revenue. 
in theory, your if your revenue goes up, your emissions might also go up because you're doing more things, you know, driving around the country more, opening new offices. So intensity targets and intensity metrics are a good way to demonstrate you've made improvements, even if your absolute emissions are going up. But that being said, we do want to reduce them over time to net zero. That's uh, yeah, you've got to do that. Uh, reduce. So in terms of the steps, um, I would kind of view the other ones as kind of desk based stuff, you know, typing away at your laptop, you know, writing things down. This is where we get out into the real world and actually do stuff with your reductions. Uh, in order to actually monitor the success of what you're doing, you're going to need a way to do that, you know, regularly. So we always talk about this, but, you know, take your meta readings, record your business travel, stuff like that. You need to monitor these things throughout the year. Two sides to that. One, it will make your life a hell of a lot easier when you come back to the end of the year and you, you're trying to find all your data because some of it will be done for you already, which is uh, really helpful. The other side to that is uh, corrective action. So it obviously depends on the business and the situation but you might spot something that needs fixing you know straight away you know like a i know a leak in your aircon system or you know a spike in electricity or a gas leak or something so we highly recommend yeah taking your meter readings from a cost perspective as well you know so you see you know what you're being billed for the way we set targets at a high level is generally through annual reduction as a percentage and then milestones so if we take gas heating, for instance, an example, you could say, you know, that we want to reduce our emissions from gas heating by about, I don't know, let's say, 6% each year. That's great, but one day we want to get rid of that gas heating. So the milestone at, say, 2028, for instance, would be to rip that out and replace it with an electric alternative. So you've got your percentage reduction targets for each um, GHG source and then your milestones. Electric vehicles, another common one, you know, you need to have a year to say, you know, look, we're going to go EV or we're going to be 50% EV by a certain year. For most bit, well, it should always be a 12 month reporting period for businesses. Um, yeah, we're looking for 12 months. Every All emissions reporting is done on a 12 month cycle, unless it's something niche such as an event or a one off thing. Normally, for most companies, your first year you do this as the baseline by default. But that being said, you know, you may want to change your baseline over time. Uh, we've worked with some companies and we've done it for a few years and realized that, you know, this certain year is a better representation, especially if you consider the impacts of COVID. So you don't want a uh, 2020 baseline. That's a bad idea. Other thing to consider uh, is communications, both within your business and outside of your business. Um, so, you know, even if it's something as simple as a reoccurring teams meeting, you know, once a week for an hour to go over, you know, GSG reporting, gathering the data. The thing with carbon reduction initiative, it's carbon reduction um, stuff is it's not actually that easy to implement in real life. It is doable and it's very important. A lot of people work very, very hard on this. There's a few sort of real world considerations you have to have. In a lot of companies, it's often determined by budget and to us how busy people are. Hence why it's uh, very, very important to make that time in the diary to actually implement this stuff, because at some point it will be, well, as we're finding out, the whole reason we're here, it's not optional. In a lot of cases, you're going to have to do it. Another real quick win, even if you're not really sure what you're doing, is just literally get some quotes. You know, phone up, you know, someone local that does solar panels or has an electric vehicle salary sacrifice scheme. Speak to them, get some quotes and, you know, some information on the actual implementation. Don't necessarily have to do anything, but it's a very good start and it's a quick win that you can do literally, you know, sat at home on your desk. Requantify. Uh, so. It's very, very important. Um, this is your opportunity to make improvements on work you've previously completed. So like I said, this is done on a 12 monthly basis with some stuff tracked throughout the year, ideally. And we are aiming for consistency. So we've got comparable results, but I'm 100% in favor of amending historic results if you get information that enables that. So if you are lucky enough to get new information that would help the calculations and make them more accurate, 100% we should implement that. But it's a fine line. Well, it's a balancing act between a uh, consistency and improving historic results. Uh, this also comes back to offsetting, which uh, will be coming on to very, very soon. Once you've actually completed that requantification exercise, you'll then know how much you need to offset. So very useful. Again, lower your emissions, lower the cost of offsetting if you are going for that. 
Uh, it's important to mention that offsetting is optional for most businesses at the moment, so don't feel like you have to immediately jump into that. That's absolutely fine. Offsetting, right? So this can be controversial sometimes, um, but just offsetting 101. This is where you purchase carbon credits to offset your emissions. So generally one tonne of carbon equals one offset credit. So if your emissions are, say, 700 tonnes, you'll need 700 credits. Simple as that. In terms of what an offset credit actually is, it is a financial contribution to a scheme that either directly removes carbon from an atmosphere or already has removed it from an atmosphere historically. So tree planting, some sort of rewilding projects, or something that actually takes carbon directly out of the atmosphere for you. The other one, and this is at a high level, of course, is um, donating to a scheme that prevents carbon going to the atmosphere. So, you know, you're you're enabling decarbonisation somewhere else. Uh, we've got some companies listed on the side here that can help with those sort of things. Uh, United Nations uh, Carbon Offset Platform and Gold Standard, uh, they're great platforms for that. They're actually listed within PASS 2060. And then we've got Nature Broking and Tree Economy who are doing some really good work in the UK on wooden carbon code offsets. Um, so we could probably do a whole presentation on offsetting, but the very, very important thing here is to get an independently verified scheme. So it's very, very important you get a scheme that has the documentation behind it. The obvious thing being you want to know it exists and it's not just someone making stuff up. Um, there's a lot of dodgy rubbish out there and you want to make sure you get the right thing. You don't want to avoid greenwashing and, you, and you know, at the end of the day, you don't want to waste your money either. So it's very, very important to get a credible scheme and do a bit of due diligence on that. It's also important to pick a scheme that aligns with your company values. So I'd highly recommend speaking to staff and I'd also highly recommend getting more than one scheme. So you don't just have to get one. You can get two, three, four, five, as many as you want within reason. In terms of the actual act of purchasing carbon offset credits, I would describe it as not too dissimilar from any other online shopping. You know, you find what you're looking for. You maybe have to make an account, give some details over add it to your basket and check out. What will happen after that is you'll get a nice certificate from the platform saying your company has offset X amount and it's contributed to certain projects. But yeah, we could probably have a whole session going on offsetting for hours, but essentially make sure you get independently verified stuff and you read the associated documentation with that. Declare, so just getting to the end of the seven step side of things. Um, what you'll need to do here, again, if you are achieving carbon neutrality, is write up a permissible declaration. So it sounds more complicated than it is, but it's essentially a very short statement. And this links to the defined stage, basically saying we have achieved carbon neutrality for X, Y, Z. You know, that will refer to different time frames, years of commitment, specific GHG sources and the subject that I mentioned earlier on. Something else you'll also have to disclose when you're declaring what's happened is whether you've done that internally, so self-verified, second party with a consultancy or independent third party. So, you know, you'll know as a business what's best for yourself, but third party verification is arguably most credibly, uh, highest level of credibility, sorry. That's again, where an external person will come in and essentially grill, your on, grill you on your figures. Um, so yeah, you can really, you can get that sort of stamp of approval from them. That also feeds in really well to any sort of um, disclosures you need to make. So climate disclosure projects, SBTI, stuff like that. It's very useful to have or any sort of tendering requirements. Second party, so that's a bit of a grey area. That would essentially be a consultancy that's worked with you. So they are independent, but they're not independent because you've paid them and they've got a vested interest. So second party is essentially a, a consultancy that have helped you and done some of the legwork for you, but they can still put their own level of independence on it, but they're not quite third party. And you've got self-verification, which is by no means a bad thing. You know, you could refer to it as marking your own homework, but I'm strongly in favour of a, a company doing this internally than not at all. Um, some big companies out there that self-verify, um, but would highly recommend get something in, you know, such as themselves to actually come in and check the figures, um, even if it's just a brief, you know, overview, would highly recommend get someone to check it. Um, the other side of declare, uh, it's more the fun side, is marketing. So generally people are a bit hesitant to do this, and I completely understand that. You don't want to say the wrong thing, but sustainability obviously has great marketing potential. Um, you know, case studies, social media posts, even a nice webinar like we're doing today. So yeah, there's great uh, marketing potential behind doing this. Uh, 
14068. Um, so yeah, as I mentioned, past 2060 is soon to be phased out. Can't remember the exact date. I think it's got a shelf life of uh, just under two years now before it's officially uh, taken out, but it's going to be replaced with 14068. Again, this is, could probably be a uh, entire session on its own for several hours, but it's designed to replace past 2060. The great thing about this standard is it has a lot more of a focus on net zero and reductions than offsetting fire offsets. So yeah, we're in favour of that. Uh, we're soon to start offering this as a service. So if anyone out there fancies being a, a guinea pig, you know, literally one of the first people in the world to implement this, please do uh, give me a give me a shout. Um, but yeah, as with a lot of ISOs, it's designed for any company. So any company can come and implement this and sort of credibly demonstrate that they've they're working towards net zero. So just to summarise achieving net zero, which obviously is um, you know feeding into the climate change amendment we're here, all here for, you need to know what your organisational emissions are. You know you need to do those calculations, even if you start small and just look at some of your more direct emissions and the uh, easy stuff. You need to know those. You need to start tracking them. It's very very important. You need to establish a base year. So base year being the year that you track um, future emissions against and compare backwards against. Again, your base year can change. That does happen over time. Again, think about, you know, if 2020 was your first year, that would be a, you know, a, a bad example because that's COVID. Things change and it's OK within reason to change your base year. You need a plan to actually implement these reductions. So again, we, we most people, you know, we know what we need to do. Most organisations know they need electric vehicles, better energy management, stuff like that. It's just you need a plan to actually implement it. You need the right people. You need the right budget need a way to monitor progress. So again, you won't know if you're net zero or carbon neutral unless you actually monitor what's going on. And again, you need a nice wide range of reporting boundaries, ideally. And I would highly advise monitoring what you can throughout the year. That will make life a lot easier. Need a plan to repeat this each year. So again, I'm always going on about this more. It's just, you know, write stuff down, create a management system for your GHG work. Don't just make a spreadsheet and publish it. And that's that and a nice table with your results. You need to write down your methodologies again coming back to the climate change amendment if you were to uh you know show an order to your ghg report and it's 40 pages of methods and carbon reduction planning and evidences to support that i'm sure that'll go down very very well if you are going carbon neutral you need a credible scheme or schemes you know plural I recommend getting more than one it's always a good thing but it's very very important you pick one that is well i say real but also independently verified so Good thing about the past 2060 approved schemes is all the information is publicly available so you can read up on that. And as I've mentioned, it's always good to have the figures checked. So we'd highly recommend getting someone in to check the figures. Um, we're all only human beings. It's very, very easy to make a little mistake on a spreadsheet or put a decimal point in the wrong place or, you know, do some inconsistent uh, methodologies. So we highly recommend having your figures checked. So, uh, yeah. Uh, Hub, so. Carly covered this off very nicely, so I won't spend too much on this, but obviously that also has the isology hub. We have the carbonology hub we're working on. So very similar thing, but it's designed for you to implement the net zero standards uh, yourself. So self-led training. Um, again, same as isology, we've got the coffee break training, game plans, workbooks, and then obviously I'll have access to ourselves for, you know, little uh, Q and A's and one-to-ones so we can sort of help you on your journey. Um, yeah, we're working on the content for that and it's going well. So if you are interested in Carbonology Hub uh, and would like to have a look at that, please do give me a, uh, a shout after this. And yeah, it's our contact details if you, contact details if you'd like to take a uh, screenshot. So please do feel free to give me a, a call or an email at any time or find me on LinkedIn. Uh, we've got our contact details here for Neve if you want to get in contact uh, and arrange a meeting with us. Oh, and a little plug, follow us on Instagram. Neve works really hard on that one. So uh, yeah, if you have Instagram, give us a follow because we're always putting um, updates on there, um, which is really useful stuff. Um, yeah, thank you for listening. Thanks, David. Um, anybody Thanks, that hasn't Carly. managed to screen grab your, your details there, we'll <laughs> send them out and um, perhaps you could put them in the chat or something as well. Excellent. Uh, so we'd so just much. like to have a quick chat to you about the climate change amendment uh, game plan. And we have put together this game plan to support your approach to the climate amendment, the change amendments. And it's developed to walk you through the process in a practical way. Okay, It's in the Isology Hub. 
and I'll walk you through the high level elements of the game plan to whet your appetite for what you can achieve. And we'll finish about looking at one of the activities in a little bit more detail. OK, so the first part of the game plan uh, explains the what we've been through in exactly, but in more detail. So it goes into what has changed and why, how it affects your management system, what are the benefits of addressing climate change in the management system in a summary. Um, but it has links to external resources and, as I say, goes through much more detail. Thank you. Section two of the game plan is very useful to helping you understand if climate change is relevant to your organisation and a set of scenarios with examples are provided to help you see how different types of business in different industries could be contributing to and affected by climate change. So by providing examples, it helps you to put different types of activities within your own organisation into context as to how they might have climate change implications. And these scenarios help provide both context to potential issues to consider, but also examples of how climate change considerations can be implemented. In section three, we dive into the various ways you can integrate this change into your management system. Those considerations are leadership commitment, strategic planning documents, interested parties, objectives, policies and monitoring and measuring. In the workbook, which is supplied in section three, this gives you guided activities to help you address the various ways you could integrate the new climate change amendment into your management system. This is where you kick off your own very own climate change game plan and you'll begin your guided activities to help you gather the information you need to better understand if and how climate change impacts your organisation and how to start integrating requirements um, into your business. Guided activities are in place for the, all the key areas noted and the game plan also links to further resources within the Isology Hub to further support your progress. Uh, number four, section four, the further resources. The topic of climate change is very broad, so we've also compiled a list of helpful resources and a base for further understanding and learning. We have the recorded, pre-recorded sessions of our Q&A calls, including the historical ones, coffee break training resources and podcasts for you to listen to at your leisure. Blackmore's partner resources include Carbonology, you've heard from David, and Carbon Free Management Checklist and Net Zero Planner. And other resources link to the Environmental Reporting Guidelines and the government-backed online Climate Hub and useful resources such as Conversion Factors. If you want to have a look at the example activities, this one is reviewing your policies. Uh, so let's take a sneaky peek at one of those in the game plan and how those policies you may have or may not have within your management system can be relevant to the climate change amendment. So you can see on here we have travel policy, expenses policy, purchasing and supplier, remote or hybrid working, employee benefits. So that could be uh, car share, cycle to work schemes. Does this include electric vehicles or hybrids? And does it incentivize the use of public transport? Your corporate social responsibility policy, environmental, social and governance, your ESG policy. Does this integrate climate change considerations into the ESG framework used for decision making? And does it include climate related metrics? Waste management policy. Does this promote reusable products or paperless initiatives to reduce waste um, generation and facilities management policy? Does this promote energy efficient practice for both premises users and owners? OK, um, so thank you so much for for listening to us. I know we've all done quite a lot of talking, so it's time to grab a quick comfort break. Um, if you please would stay in this meeting, we will um, put you into the other groups at about quarter past, you've got about five minutes, and you'll be in your selective interactive workshop. Thanks. Carly, just to just to also mention is that um, there's actually been a, a little bit of a slight change for the uh, workshop that David was going to be doing. Those people that were attending that can actually attend the ISO 14064 workshop for now, um, as David's covered quite a lot already in that presentation. Um, so you might find that there's a slight change if you're in workshop four, you'll now be in workshop three.
hope that's OK. And um, drop us a note in the chat if there's any change on that. Any any changes that you'd like to make? Thank you.